a good word. Before before we start, my brother, when we lived in Columbia, Missouri, is a college town, and he would hang out with some of the people. And for one hour a week, World of Warcraft would shut down to to like clean up the servers and make sure everything was okay and everything. And there was no joke, a group of dudes that got together for that hour and sat around and talked about World of Warcraft for that hour. Like, no joke. It was from like Tuesday from like nine o'clock at night to 10 o'clock at night or something like that. And they would all, all the people who played WoW during that hour would get together and sit around and talk about WoW. Should and, I should I in, infer from that that besides that they were nonstop playing World of Warcraft? I think that's the implication. Well, hello and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And tonight I'm here to ask Father Turbo and Cyprian, is Punk dead? And if Punk is dead, when did it die? Or if it's still alive, why is it still alive? I'm unqualified for this. Oh, I will defer to you too. Man. Uh... I think it's dead. I think it's been dead for a while. I think. There's well, a- can we first make? Can we first do some definition? Like, can we first define terms? Sure. Because do you mean the music, or do you mean the culture? I think what it, both. It's both and in the sense of like what it originally was supposed to be, and what it turned into. Yes. I think okay. the forefathers, your protos, and your pioneers, both would agree that the message is dead. <sighs> I that's my hot take. I could be wrong. Well, is it present in any other culture, scene, or subculture currently? Did it I evolve would... into something? Is there any branch where it's still alive? I'm sure that question. there are people who are still absolutely okay. So, if you really want to define punk by a certain nihilism, then yeah, okay. like there's a band, The Exploited, they're doing what they set out to do when they're they're junkies they're all you know they're still using you know they're still playing shows to feed their habit there's a certain nihilistic aspect to them but is that what punk was supposed to be or is that what punk corrupted into no, that's not supposed to be it's not, it's not su- supposed to be that and i and i wouldn't even really i wouldn't really even look at the exploited as a i mean they're it's a facet dead, you know and this and that but like mm, uh you know this is this is i don't know andrew i don't know if this is the right question because this might just dominate the whole show because... <laughs> i mean i have no problem with that I, I think it's i think it'll end up going in a nice direction if we can flesh it out yeah i think there's yeah, some stuff here yeah so like there's there's two things i mean man oh man i know it floods the brain with yeah different, there's like, just so much here down. because like Cause there is, and it's so funny because I was just thinking about Jim Morrison mm-hmm. and the, um, basically the Intel community and that connection. Mm-hmm. I don't. Like, can you expand on his that? dad was CIA, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And like, there is this thing where culture is weaponized. It's constructed and weaponized. You know, and there's definitely a facet of, like punk that was there that was i i look at certain things like yeah looking back on it there's a lot of like maybe not forged by intel but definitely adopted you know what Mm -hmm. i mean um you're speaking of it like kind of being a psyop or the yeah yeah to a certain degree to a certain degree um and and I think it's a lot more complicated than people make it out to be because like, we'll, we'll take like a real easy one for a lot of people, the sex pistols. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure someone's going to clickety clackety and send some super obscure article on John Lydon and 
his connections to like Rockefeller. I don't know. But I don't know. That dude seems Yeah, I mean, and, and that's kind of the thing is like, you know, I mean, I've I have followed his career pretty closely as long as I've been, you know, around. He's a smart man. He, well, yes, and he's also a boorish man at the same time. Mm, 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 mm. And uh, even like some of the things that I would point to, like the reasons why people don't like him now, because it just feels like, you know, he's an old geezer, give it up, out of touch. A lot of people got super mad at him for, you know, taking up the kind of Trump banner. Um, Didn't he like speak of on the queen or something like that too yeah he? he gave he gave some props to the queen and even that i just think when people like lost their minds on that i thought that's a great example of people being silly because one of the problems i mean i man there's so many levels to talk about this. i know like one of the problems per se with like the whole punk ethos is that a lot of people who have the punk like someone who has the punk ethos they wouldn't have done that because the punk ethos doesn't mean that you have to be emotionally retarded your whole life Mm-hmm. and so a lot of people they think punk ethos means being the kind of like perpetual petulant adolescent forever and mm-hmm. that's not the punk ethos right um but at the same no. time there's the other people who i think want to put and i lean definitely more towards this side there's the people who want to give a little too much favor to punk as a movement and give it a little bit wider breadth than it deserves. And I'm guilty of that. I- I'm guilty of that, you know, because guilty of doing that or not wanting. I'm to- guilty of doing that because yeah. for me, you know, I mean, I've, I've just, t- I've talked extensively about subculture. So there's no reason for me to, to talk about it here, I guess. But I think the thing is, is like subculture in general, but punk specifically is an interesting beast because it, it takes certain elements of I mean contemporary history and puts them in the kind of like a retroactive lens if that makes sense like you can look at like the 60s and the 50s and even getting into like the 40s and World War II with like in the lens of punk and see some pretty interesting things that I don't think you can see out without those punk lenses you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like you can't. Is that is that because you're watching? Because you're looking at a lineage? Is that what it is, or is it I, just like a phronema type of thing? It's if a phronema. I can, it's if a I can phronema, say, it's, it's a phronema, and it, and it's definitely, um, it, it's it's definitely the kind of. I guess I'll put it to you this way. You know how? Um, let me give two examples. Someone's like talking trash on your sister. You're like, hey. Don't talk trash on my sister, right? But then you'll talk trash on your sister because, like, that's a family, right? That's a family affair. So, like, on that one hand, because one of the things that people lose out when they talk about punk in particular is they don't really know the connections to punk. And so they don't understand how actually powerful of a critique it is of, like, former cultures, because mm-hmm. because it's coming from the inside more than people realize. Like a lot of people view punk as this kind of like anomalous thing, like the Quran, you know, that just kind of popped out of nowhere and like, but it has an origin and it has an origin in certain, you know, cultural movements. Um, and so because of that, it's able to really give an interesting critique that you can't see outside. It's the same thing like, you know, um, my sister would give a critique on me that would just blow people away because she's my sister. And no one would ever be able to maybe even like follow that critique, but it would still be accurate because of that particular connection. Are you following me at all what I mean by that? So so no. so it's so it's so it's an inside, it's something inside. It's a it's a movement that's in deeply yeah. inside the culture, commenting on yeah. the culture yeah. from inside, yeah. as opposed to externally commenting on, let's say, like enemies. Yeah. Like your enemies would comment from the outside, yeah. but this is commenting from inside, yeah. the, deeply inside the culture. Yeah. Yeah. And and and, and recognizing that, itself as part of that culture as see, well. That's that's where it gets twisted. Is that okay. people with a punk ethos recognize that. But a lot of people don't really have what I would call a genuine punk ethos. And I know I sound like that guy now, and I am. That's fine. But, but a, how lot could people, you? a lot of people view it as, this, as the external thing. But 
if you're talking about punk as a lens to critique, which I think that's the purpose of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that that's why that's the only thing that gives me pause to say, like, I don't feel the need to constrict punk to exclusively fashion and music no. of a of a specific type of genre and time period, however far removed it is. I don't, you know what I mean? But like I said earlier, I'm also one of those guys who's guilty of giving it probably a, a wider breadth than people, than, than it deserves. But I think the thing is, is punk is a very interesting phenomena and it is one of those um hallmarks of the end days of the last days because really you can't go any further than punk like punk in its essence and punk as an ethos it's like the end stop because the only thing left is resurrection right like punk is death punk is the final critique punk is the the final unraveling on, on a lot of levels even getting into the like if you could, you know, the kind of like metaphysics of it and like how it manifests in the world and what because, it does. Because you can't make a critique of punk because punk itself is the manifestation of a critique, right? So if, if it's, so so you can't go critique. meta, you can't flip it. You can't flip, you can't flip it flip again. It. There's, yeah, yeah. okay. Oh, that's, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, that's you can't, what... like, you literally can't flip it. It's It's like the end, you know what I mean? And so I think that's another thing that people have lost out on in regards of this kind of conversation. Because number one, there's very few from my, I mean, they're probably out there. I don't want to say that. I'm just not exposed to um, religious, like people who are either religious, theologically educated, um, sp like spiritualist, like spiritualists, occultists, you know, just people moving in metaphysics and spirituality. I'm just not as familiar with people doing this kind of analysis. So I'm nobody. I'm sure there's a whole like library full of guys who are brilliant and good looking and they've done it. But from my perspective, everything that I've seen on a lot of levels, not just like from the music and I keep up, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to be like, I'm out there in the backyards, but I keep up kind of like, I keep up on a lot of levels, you know, not just with like bands, but even like how, how people are the pastiche of it and like how it's being regurgitated and but all those things. That's, that would be my argument on why if it's not dead, I would say that it's like, it is, it's not what it was and I'm not being eloquent, but like it is so much and like, we've talked about like the pastiche of culture before and how like zoomers or whoever they go on Amazon and they buy like the punk kit. Yeah. Like the kit to buy the right jeans with the right patches. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just feel like to order to have a conversation at the level we want to have it, or like I think is interesting, we have to move past those like really kind of like accidentals of it. The accidentals well, of it. Like you, you, here's why, here's why. Like let's compare punk with like hip hop and metal. Okay. Now, punk and hip hop have much more of a corollary, a corollary than punk and metal does, interestingly enough. And and why is that? It's because both punk it's and It's the critique. It's the social critique. Yes. Both punk and hip hop are a social critique. Whereas metal is for the most part, as I've understood it, metal is mostly um Metal, metal is essentially like an expression of kind of like bass movements, not based as in like hashtag based, but like um, anger and violence and yeah, and even just it's, a, it's an artistic, it's an artistic form of sentiment, right? Like you're trying to push a sentiment rather than an. an to communicate a, a narrative critique yes and the closest thing to that i would say obviously would be like authentic black metal and the thing what about trash. metal the thing about metal now now the thing about metal from my perspective versus hip-hop and punk is that it is a critique insofar as it's critiquing on a spiritual level um the kind of 
nominalism, like the nominalist Christianity, the nominalist influence of uh, kind of post-Christian morality on things. And it and it's one that is not self-conscious, not like punk is. Like punk is a critique and knows it's a critique. Like that's that's one of the things. Hip hop is a but it's mostly a political critique, right, Father? Like punk is mostly a political critique, but metal is a spiritual critique in that because it goes to because it's going to the left. Correct. Because it 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 purposely goes to the left. Correct. Correct. But it doesn't Mm, have the self awareness that punk and hip hop has. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think I think that's why when we say okay, punk is dead. Like okay, so yeah, so the pastiche of it, all that, yeah, punk's been dead since probably the refused. Like that was probably like the last kind of like upspring of punk that was like okay, like that's about as far as like is that like ninety four. Yeah, like, the shape of punk to come is yeah, that what you're talking yeah. About? And I mean that. I mean I hate to put it like that, but like I I feel like that's probably when hip hop died in the same way though, father, as a viable critique. Yeah mid 90s yeah that's what that's what they call the golden age of hip-hop then it was that was it it was over yeah yeah and so you know i think like i think there are things that we could talk about in regards of and this is where it gets sticky because it's like someone would say to me well that's not punk meaning i'm not talking about uh, the refuse because the refuse is definitely punk but like teenage atari riot so someone would be like is that punk that's really more industrial. That's really more. And I was like, well, I look at Teenage Atari, uh, Teenage Atari Riot as a, uh, I, th- I think it is still in that vein of that ethos because then there's definitely in the aesthetic because it, it's tackling the kind of advent of the digital age. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's this kind of, Teenage Atari Riot's interesting because I see them as this like very explicitly and self-consciously like cyberpunk kind of thing. If you're not familiar with Teenage Atari Riot, I would say check it out. They did. It, I haven't looked at them for a long, like decade plus, but I imagine if I was to go back even now, I'd find some really interesting things about them. Because even at the time, I was like, this is an interesting statement on kind of like what's what's going to be shaping what's happening, but the shape of punk to come. I mean, again, <laughs> no, no pun intended there. But I just think like it, this is an interesting thing because no punk intended. <laughs> the the thing that kind of throws everything for a loop is is this the digital, is the digital aspect of everything. Like, and and here's why, because the digital aspect of everything, it almost is the kind of like um cyprian you might be able to know the better a better word for it but it's almost like we're in another category if well the media sense. the medium is the message the like medium can is... can punk be electronic i would say no no i think it by definitely... definition it can't be no my, I, I would say okay so all right all right hold on i think it totally can be because one of the things i've always loved about punk is its versatility and yes back in the day to be an og punk rocker you did kind of have to be anti-keyboard a little bit no i don't mean keyboards i don't mean keyboards that keyboards don't define electronic music sure what defines electronic music is drums drum machines Mm -hmm. that's 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 what I, i don't think if you have drum machines that it's punk i don't think that that could be considered punk i mean okay so Cyprian. yeah and see that's why that's why i would say Teenage Atari Riot and, and going back to them because I think that like okay man so there was a there was a band called Six Six Sputnik that came out in like gosh 80 88 no no not even that late like 84 83 82 I don't know maybe someone google it while I'm like talking and like Six Six Sputnik got it um the bass player was this guy, Tony James, from this band, Generation X, which was Billy Idol's breakthrough band. 82. 82, okay. So even earlier. So 66 Sputnik is this kind of like case study because it's really early, but they really anticipated a lot of the aesthetics. So like 
They had a drum machine. Now someone's like, it's not where are they. Long. Where are they from? Where's the band from? They're from the UK. I think. Okay. I think the singer. I, I feel like the singer was like some other weird European thing. I think his name was Martin something. But like, okay. the thing is, is here's the thing. They had drum machines. They brought in a very explicitly self-aware cyberpunk vibe long before Teenage Atari Riot um, with like the whole kind of like Tokyo, like like techno Tokyo, like cyberpunk move. If you look at their aesthetic, you'll it'll, it'll get what I'm saying. Martin Degville. Degville. Martin, De- Martin De- Degville, yeah. And so shoot it up, uh, Sputnik F one eleven. I think I think the name of the, the their big song was, but Love Missile F eleven F eleven, and then like the chorus was shoot it up. Anyways, so you see, and this is this is why I'm going back to it. You see bands like this that are, that are anticipating more than anyone else was. Now, granted, it's in a campy way what the digital age was going to bring in regards of synthetic sex, synthetic, um, everything synthetic, synthetic sex, synthetic ex- uh, experience. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, well, it's so, forgive me, it's so interesting that you say that and the year because 83 is the same year that Juan Atkins and the, the young kids in Detroit are making t- Detroit techno. That's like Cybotron, Techno City comes out, the record comes out in 1983. And that's where the word te- that's where techno gets its name from, mm-hmm. right? And they were influenced by Kraftwerk. See, that's, and and see, this is the whole thing because you have to look at all these kind of like periphery movements that are happening. Because someone was, I mean, we can splinter out. You know, there's like obviously death rock. There's gothic music. There's you know uh, industrial. All three of those. You can pick key bands that have an electronic quote unquote influence, but they all kind of tie back into punk, right? And so this is why I'm saying like, you know, punk is this interesting thing because if you're looking at it, at least from the way I look at it, it's a much broader thing without without um, giving like bad, it's a much broader thing without making the error of giving it too much breath like i was saying does that make sense what i, what I just said right there right so like, so so wait let me let me see if i can let me see if i could flesh this out because this is this is interesting to me and i think it could actually go into an interesting place for this podcast so there's a, and i think that this is something that's that maybe people thought was happening with or maybe it was happening in the 80s with hip-hop and then something something happened i don't know whether it was gangster rap i don't know what it was where this stopped but it's like that the ethos is influencing is influencing the 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 medium in a way and the music is coming from out of the out of the medium so it's even to, so and this is what i'm saying where i'm going with like the because it's funny because even juan atkins himself who i became friends with when i was in la he was on my pirate radio station like the creator yeah. of techno right and he's like no i was influenced he says he's influenced by punk he can name off the bands mm-hmm. right and he was like None of the black kids around us were listening to any of this music. We were the only ones listening to it. And that's why we were the ones who ended up creating this other music. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's like Mm -hmm. that there's that there's something about this critique, this ethos that says there has to be this critique that like that forces. What does it force? It's like it's almost like I can't play these instruments because these are part of the culture that I'm critiquing. I can't play in this way. Well, because that would that because I'm critiquing this yeah. this style of playing or whatever. Yes. So here's the thing. This is this is the key thing about punk is that punk punk is is a forced edit. Like there's certain boundaries that are right, expand often, on that expand on that. Okay. There's certain boundaries that are sometimes imperceptible that like you can't necessarily articulate it, but you know when you crossed it. We're like, okay, this is now out of the punk realm. You know what I'm saying? And it's like that edit is what facilitates to some degree the potential for it to live because the creativity that comes from having to, um, there's a there's a term for this where the bound, like boundary produces creativity, right? I, I can't remember what the term is, forgive me, I'm a dummy. Um, 
but but that's a thing right now follow me on this right if you think about how punk can be this um you miss those edits and those boundaries if you're looking at it purely from a visual or audio aesthetic if you're limiting punk to just like it has to have this this kind of look to some greater or lesser degree or it has to have this sound to some greater or lesser degree then it's not punk you mm -hmm. have a problem because you're going to miss a lot of things that actually contain a punk ethos because that core essence of it which is the critique is there and it's a particular critique it isn't just like critiquing for the sake of critiquing it has a particular critique right and the interesting thing is punk is one of those things that <clears throat> it wields it isn't it isn't like a nihilism cuz that's definitely there but it 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 it, it wields a um it wields a disdain that like the punk critique wields a disdain that can very easily spill into despair or nihilism but not necessarily not necessarily right and so that's one of the reasons why it's it's an interesting phenomenon because it isn't as dull or as two-dimensional as people think it is because i can come up with a bunch of different bands that i mean i'll give you one eye at the top of my head the clash the clash is a band that the punk critique is not nihilistic mm -hmm. right it, it, in fact it it, it it it's a rather um i don't want to say hopeful but for lack of a better word right now it, it's a little bit more open-ended but it still maintains that disdain if you're following me right so like it had it has this kind of like critique which, which makes it very different from a lot of other subculture movements now here's the thing that's interesting i think the ideal i think where these things cross is definitely in the band um time zone and the band time zone or the project there's a project called time zone which was uh John Lydon, after he left the Sex Pistols and already been, I think, I think by that time, PIL, um, Public Image Limited was on its like third or fourth album. So it's a little, it's a couple years in, but maybe not, it might be even earlier. And African Bombada, African Bombada and John Lydon did a project called The Time Zone, right? Great song, you know, it's like great song, incredible video, right? Reagan era, total, um, uh, um, nuclear scare, right? Like, there's a great, <laughs> there's a great portion. And I mean, there's so many great things from it. Uh, from John Lydon being in a hotel room in California, watching Reagan on the screen, wiping his face on the screen with blood, um, you know, just blood falling out of his mouth on a shirt, which is very unusual for Lydon in that sense. Um, so that's an interesting portion of it. African Mabata in Brooklyn somewhere, you know, this is core hip hop stuff. I mean, he's wearing a wig and like a Dracula cape, you know, and like people are just like, like these B-boys are breaking. And it's this interesting thing where African Mabata, I mean, the song's about the end of the world, right? And so you have this real kind of like, prophetic utterance of things are wrong things need to get straight and john lydon who's notoriously you know i guess kind of like anti-religious in that sense is in a song with african babata talking about you know um the world's coming to an end there's a line there he says you and i both know what the bible tells you and john lydon is working with this the same one who said i'm an antichrist you know all these things so there, in this snapshot of this project, you have these living critiques and these living paradoxes almost that really define that kind of like punk ethos, but it isn't necessarily what people would think it is. Like African Bombada and, you know, the, the folk in, in Brooklyn, the B-boys, they look more punk than Johnny Lydon does, 
you know, they're wearing leather gloves and spikes and everything. And that's what people don't understand is that there was this cross pollination that was incredible. And it, it proves my point in regards of like, why was that cross pollination possible? Because there's an ethos that's there that that there's a critique that's there you know what i mean let me let, let me let me see this this tell me tell me if this is fitting because i think that this is this also has some people have been talking a lot a lot for some reason this week the the libertarian to orthodox pipeline has become particularly something that people's minds are on i don't know i don't know why but just in like my uh-oh are you guys there yeah, yeah. you're just uh, still you are a little <laughs> you are a little laggy cyprian oh Terrible, yeah. terrible. Okay, so, so I'll make it fast. What I'm hearing is something like punk's, punk is not defined by what it is. It's defined by what it's not. That's so right. the, the box is what it's not. Anything that, anything that doesn't cross over the line of what it's not could be included within this box. And in that way, I think that there's, I think, in speaking about orthodoxy with people and in experiencing orthodoxy myself, I find that a lot of times it's, and especially reading the saints, that it's like, because some saints will absolutely not do something where other ones will absolutely do it. And they're both saints. Right. Yes. right? But yeah. it's, and it's, so it's not like if I'm looking for, well, what is it? What is the, I was talking on Sunday with the brothers here. Like, you know, if you're looking for a set of moral rules, it's like, it's not going to work. But if you're looking for what are the boundaries of the church, like that you don't go beyond, that you can do. Like the fathers are there to tell you that, right? But it's like, so so it's that thing. It's this, and I think maybe that's what that's where a difference of like hip hop now would be, is that there's no boundaries anymore on it. Mm -hmm. There's no boundaries on what is and isn't. That that ended like a long time ago. Late nineties. Hip yeah, hip hop. There's no boundaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is interesting because, you see, hip hop's so fascinating to me in this sense, because, like, what makes hip hop hip hop? And now it's so watered down on one hand, maybe ambiguous on one hand. It's like if you have a beat, and someone doing something rhymy. Someone says or that's hip hop, or not? Just talking. You know I mean? Yeah, or not? And yeah, exactly. that, and now that's hip hop, right? And so, this is this is like the 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 kind of like example for punk would be that people just think if you just got drums and a fast kind of like guitar, that's punk. It's like no, that's you know what I mean. That's like uh, it could be just rock now or like whatever, right? So. The, again, what what makes the thing the thing? I mean, it, it's the inner, and this is why. I mean, this is see, it's interesting because you you get into the spirit of the thing, right? It's not the external, right? Although the external does have a play, does have a part to play. It's 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 the essence of the thing, and the essence of the thing is not something that is so easily defined. But like you said, it's like the you know we could say we, it's better to understand it apathetically, right? We understand what it is by not by not saying what it is. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I think this is this is interesting because this is part of the reason why number one theology is so important because theological terms and and movements and principles help you if you if you know what they are and you are working to integrate them in your life in a practical way you can discern the world around you, right? But if you don't know what they are, then everything just seems like such a gobbly goop of, I don't even know what it is. And that's where most people are. Most people are in this place where they're like, okay, that's just whatever music. And then they just categorize it for better, for worse, in a way that may not be accurate. You know what I mean? And I, I think that's problematic. That's a big part of the reason why music is such a powerful weapon. And it's so easy to sway whole segments of society with you know the the easiest of of, of a jingle because yeah. people aren't the faculties aren't developed in such a way because people don't look at things with a theological or spiritual lens you know um, or they relegate that to like oh well, that's for the professionals you know which which it is to some degree don't get me wrong 
it is to some degree, but I, but I, the reason why I think this is important is because when you see how ubiquitous quote unquote hip hop is, which I would say most of what people think is hip hop, I wouldn't consider hip hop, I guess, but who am I to say? Agreed, agreed. No, I agree. You know, but I would definitely say a lot of what people say is punk isn't punk in that same sense. And so because of that, I would say, yeah, so I, I guess on one hand, that's great if you're just going to disregard all of it. God bless you, but good luck. Who can do that? You know what I mean? So it's better to have some sort of grip on it and be like, well, this is what this is and this is why it exists. And it's really interesting, forgive me, I know I'm belaboring the point, but just to kind of bring it home, it's interesting to me because I came back, you know, I, I did this um, homeschooling, uh, classical education, Orthodox education conference this last weekend. And, you know, I was talking about a beauty first ethos, but not beauty as in like pretty, like, oh, that's pretty, you know, but, but beauty as revelation of Christ. And one of my big points in there is that people, Orthodox Christians, traditional Christians, traditionally minded moral people, they're so scared of the bleak, the banal and the boorish that they're not willing and thus not able to train their children how to discern these things. So it's like, listen, um, I don't really think that you're gonna like either A, build a tower and lock your kid in that tower, like good luck with that. Or B, like how many of you are actually out there farming in the hinterlands and have no internet, no nothing, none of you, right? Nobody does. So your kids are gonna encounter this stuff, right? And beyond that, this gets us back to that that um, letter from a few weeks ago, that letter from um, uh, Diogenes, the, um, that letter to Christians, right? And like that ethos, that Christian ethos of being pilgrims and sojourners in this world, if we have that ethos, then we're like, okay, well, Christians have always done this. We've looked at pagan philosophy and pagan culture and pagan art and looked at it and and seen what could be baptized, what could be extrapolated, right? And I think this is my kind of key point is that these things, we do better if we have an eye on it and we don't walk in fear of like, these things are like far better and stronger than Christ. And therefore, like, if we even come in contact with it, like we're doomed. I, I don't think that's a healthy attitude. Now, I'm not saying to not have discernment. I'm not saying like, you know, throw your kids to the wolves. That's not what I'm saying at all, right? But someone would say, okay, you guys have been talking for like an hour about punk, it doesn't matter. And I'd say, yeah, it does matter because I'll take your kid or I'll take your, I'll take your nephew who's 25 or 30 and all the things that you think are wrong with them, I'll show you how it relates. You know what I mean? I'll show you where and why his kind of like touch points of culture are where they're at. You know what I mean? And so that can either work in your benefit or work against you. And that usually if you're not aware of it and you're operating out of fear and unhealthy, unhealthy isolationism, that's where you end up. You end up crippling people and leaving them vulnerable to those influences because there's no discernment, right? And then on top of that, you're festering a forbidden fruit attitude where it's like the second they encounter something, the very spectacle of something. That's another thing. It's like there's an aspect of the spectacle in punk, but it's not the core thing. But for a lot of people, the spectacle hooks them and then they're just addicted to the spectacle, right? And they think that's punk. It's like shock. It's like shock isn't the whole thing either yeah you know I mean? but if you're not aware of that then you get hooked on the real low level stuff of shock and then it's like but that's i think that was my point from earlier is just that like people go in and order like the punk kit but they're missing the heart and that's how you have like people going into chipotle wearing like checkerboard masks like well they're like supposedly like rocking like rocking punk attire it's like <laughs> you've missed like the point like yeah you are theoretically maybe on tiktok or whatever a punk rock person because you can name the bands you can name the albums and when they came out perhaps you've even got like some really good vinyls like first pressings whatever but like that's that's high and mighty coming from like your apartment on like in kansas city terms like the plaza and like you're going to chipotle wearing like you know like the whole get vaxxed or get out you know like that type of thing it's like that is my big and i think that's one of the driving forces why i think it's dead is because the critique it was critiquing is no longer there 
that critique. Well, it's it's material. It's materialism that you're describing, right? It's that if you if you view it, because materialism necessarily, when it writes its box, materialism can never write a box of, the box consists of what it's not. Like materialism is always the the and any materialist ethos is always what's inside. It has to be right because how do you market a product without you have to actually show the product, right? You have to name it, you have to give it a brand, you have to show the product. This is what it is. You can never. It's only it's only in the spiritual can we say like no, it's not that, right? It's like whenever some uh oh got a big plane. I don't know why passing over. I think there's. I think we're gonna go to war with China, folks, because we're because I got a big military plane doing maneuvers over Saipan. So I think we're going to war with China, folks. Wow. But um, heard it here first. It's only. I, I mean, it's only through a spiritual lens because it's always that thing where it's like, how do you define it? Well, I can't define define it, but I know it when I see it. Mm-hmm. That you that that's like anti materialist by its very nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's important too because again, this is just one facet of the bigger kind of gem that we need to be we need to understand what we're looking at. Does that does that make sense? Because the need for discernment, I guess this rolls us back to what we've always been talking about. Like the need for discernment is so important because this is just a little a little kind of placeholder for a lot of other things that we could talk about i mean we've been this has kind of been a thread for us the 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 medium you know and the message and like how to really kind of discern these things right because like on on like what level do we want to like pull it apart do we want to talk about psyops which is like getting us back to the kind of initial thing like we could do that you know we could talk about how if you don't have at least the the kind of beginning parts of developing the faculties the noose you know to really kind of like cut through things just the medium itself a lot of people are are like done for because just the medium of itself people see something on a screen and they go like it's true like i don't even have we don't even have to talk about deep fakes we don't have to talk about i mean ai generated images like it's just on that alone you have a problem right and let me just drill down one little bit, one one level below that. If you're not even thinking about the need to discern these things, which a lot of people aren't, that's a problem. You know what I'm saying? Like people aren't even thinking about like the ramifications of these. And now I know there's lots of people who are. We can all find articles and we're all reading it, right? And I guess our audience would typically be an audience that gets it, right? So we're talking about the very small percentage of let's say our audience, like we're some privileged few, you know what I mean? And the vast majority of people who are on YouTube and and I don't even know what this thing is. There's some app where you can like make the AI work for you and generate like images, you know what I mean? It's like people are now, they think wielding, but they're not wielding it. They're just, it's 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 wielding them you know what i mean it's it's using them to it's using them as its eyes and its ears and it's uh it's father what father what's so these these image generation i'm this is honestly like for me this is this is like my big issue right now these image generation things have gotten the algorithms and these platforms have gotten so have improved so much over the last like four months like over four months, father, they went to, they went from crappy. Remember when I sent you guys that thing? I was like, oh, I told it to do St. Cyprian. That was the last one I did. I told it to do St. Cyprian and it was weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that was the best it could do like five months ago. And now it's doing things that are indistinguishable from photos. Mm-hmm. And it's like, the, how did it do that? Mm-hmm. How did it do that? Because people kept using it and telling it what was good and not because it has no eyes. So like it's been using humanity as its eyes. And now it's like, oh, as now I see body. It's as its body. It's, as pos- body. it's possession. It's like I'm like it weren't worth it. It's antichrist because in the place of because the body of Christ, where the eyes, the feet, the hands of Christ, that same. Oh, me- saying, oh I didn't even see that, Father. It's, oh, it's, no. It's, it's, it's literally Antichrist. It's literally like Antichrist. 
and this is why it's so this is why it's so scary and, and crazy is because um even if possible even the elect would be deceived right and everyone's looking still at the it's on such a it's just kind of it's on a different category you know what i mean and even for myself i'm just kind of like i'm still stuck on the fact of like you know we we bat this back and forth in some of our threads but it's like are people like do it is anybody who's making the money and in charge not watching science fiction movies like do they not know how this goes no you know i think I mean? they want it i my, i've come to the conclusion that they're that they actively know where this is going and they want it yeah i mean predictive programming right but like that whole reality of this is going somewhere and and there's people who know where it's headed and they want it to go there like you know there's a certain south african inventor you know the real life you know anti tony stark whatever it's like he's one of those guys he's he's one of those guys well he was he i didn't even know this but he was one of the founders of open ai which produced these ais that are doing both the chat the chat bot and the image so like i didn't even it was all hidden nobody's talked about the fact that he was one of the founders of open ai and then he came out and admitted that that the the chatbot was using Twitter's data before he before he joined Twitter, it had all of Twitter's data to use to train itself. Every tweet that every person had ever done to train itself, and he was like, "Oh, I was unaware of that. I didn't know." Man, I it's so funny because we're you know it's one of those things we're watching. Um, you know the stereotype of being in the movie, a horror movie, and I was like, "Don't go in there! Don't go in there!" You know, it's like the whole world's the the horror, the, like the horror movie. Now it's like, you know, there's certain, there's some of us who are yelling, "Don't go in there, dummy! Don't you know?" But it's like it, you're seeing it play out. You know, you're seeing it. But play this out. this is that this I think, Father, this this goes to this idea of like being able to discern what's beyond the boundary, mm -hmm. right? Where it's where it's beyond like. This is so clear. I think most people, anybody who's within these sort of social critique, who, who has discernment from any movement that is a social critique in the way that we're talking about, can easily see that like these things are the places that you just don't go. Like anyone with a punk ethos would immediately look at what's look at this AI generation and be like, absolutely not. Okay, Are you so kidding me? The thing, Cyprian, like that's one of the things that was in the back of my mind. I was like, we, you need to get to that when Andrew first brought up. Because remember, like, there's so many levels. That's one thing right there. 2020 was the great betrayal of it. It's like I've talked with this with a couple of people. It's like what, like certain people, certain um, communities the punk community on the level that I'm talking about, right? First ones to kind of like fall for it. It's yes. like, what, what happened? Yes. You know what I mean? And there's been people like Harley, there's been people like John Joseph from the Crow Mag and some other people who've like talked about it, but it's like people with the genuine punk ethos should have been the first people to, to suss out like, Something's not right with this. And then as well, look the, at Rage Against the Machine. Rage oh against, I mean, <laughs> Rage for the Machine, right? Rage like, for the Machine. You know, they're did a great you, example of like PSYOP cats. I mean, did you know, know that they literally released a tweet? And I'm sure I've mentioned this because this was a defining moment in my life when I saw it. Was that they were like, in this case, it's best to do what they tell you. Wash your oh, hands. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's back, pretty much it. Like, that's like, wow. Okay. Wow. PSYOP. Yeah. 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 And looking back again, speaking and not having the true ethos, like it is what it is. I think I've talked about this before, so I won't beat this dead horse. But Tom Morello is like, he is that guy, the guitarist for Rage Against the Machine. He is that guy that he at 13 saw a punk rock show or whatever and was like, I'm going to go do that. But nothing changed inside. Like nothing changed inside. He was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sure and take lots of pictures of me marching in marches and wearing like the black flat or like the black power symbol and stuff like that. I'm gonna start talking. I'm gonna play up my ethnicity a lot. I'm gonna start like this is just an example, and then I'll be done. But I guess he went, he was on tour in Seattle with Audio Slave, 
which is his band after Rage Against the Machine. And he's sitting there trying to get into a restaurant with Chris Cornell, the singer of Audio Slave. You know, may God grant him the kingdom. And he basically tells the steward, the steward's like, we have no room. There is no room for you guys to come into this restaurant. And in front of Chris Cornell, Tom Morello says, do you like Rage Against the Machine? Like in front of the dude that he's currently in a band with. And the guy's like, yeah, I know who you are. You still can't get in. He's like, okay. And then like was live tweeting the whole thing. And they're like, this is that dude. So he just hops on every wagon. He, I've, I've had a, a thing about Tom Morello for like 15 years. I just do not like that guy. I just think that he's a prime example of a person who weaseled his way into a scene. Um, and then nothing changed on the inside for him. Like the rebellion was never real. Aesthetic. He 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 mastered that's, the aesthetic, the form. He mastered the he mastered the form. But but I think and and that's the thing of like what is it as opposed to what is what isn't it? Because the person who recognizes who recognizes what it isn't can innovate. But the person who only sees the the aesthetic of what it is, they can only imitate. Because all the blank space, they can never fill it in. Right? They can never fill in all, the, oh, that hasn't been done, but it's still within the boundaries. They can never go there because they can only imitate what they've already seen being done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Banal. <laughs> banal. It's banal. Yes. It, it be, but it, it also, it speaks to the reason why such an individual would fall for something like in 2020. Because they have no escape from out of that. Right. right. They they ha they have no answer. They can't solve any problem. New a new issue comes up. They can't address it. Ex they, okay. they can't address yes, it. Yes, exactly. And this is what we were talking about in the power of music. And I'm sorry, Father. I'm yeah. I'm gonna say something in a much more clumsy way than you probably would have, but whatever. Uh, that is what I, that's why that's the psyop aspect of it. And from the way that I see things, is because they gave people speaking of boxes, they gave people a box to play in. You mm -hmm. rebel against these things. Mm -hmm. They are left leaning. You're going to end up in your old age, kind of like an NPR listening to like liberal. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be like sit every Sunday morning reading the communist manifesto in a coffee shop, like just waiting to be asked about it. And then um, as long as you stay in that box, you're OK. But and you're still rebelling, which is why like people think they're still bucking the system by like supporting the transgender movement or supporting mm -hmm. black lives matter and they're like we're rebellious for doing this and it's like but you're clearly not you're still well with it well here's the thing here's the thing it's the it's rebellion for the sake of rebellion that that's why it's rebelliousness just for the sake of rebelliousness right versus yes. this and this is this is where it's like punk was a great on-ramp it was a great kind of like sky chariot to get to the church because like, yeah, there is something to rebel against. But then once you see what it is, if you don't jump from that car, you're toast. And so people just end up staying in that car of rebellion just for the sake of rebellion because it plays on the passions. It plays on the passions because it plays on the, the vanity and the pride, you know, the outrage, all those things, right? But once you get like, okay, what am I really rebelling against? And that's what the ethos did for her. That's why I defended the way I do is because there wouldn't have been any other construct to, to get me. And I, you know, I could say other people too, I've talked with, you know, like to that point of being like, what is going on here? You know what I mean? What is really going on here? Because if you don't have that, kind of questioning ethos in this time because remember what we're talking about i'm saying punk is the end of it because now it's like you can almost take like this is the end of like civilization definitely western civilization not the world like it's the kind of breakdown of everything the critique of everything that we've done so what's left okay the final critique is is an apocalyptic one right it's an apocalyptic one and it's one that is keyed into what is being revealed do you do you, are you following me like once you kind of get that it's like what's being revealed here and then what's underneath it is the war what is the war 
Because that's one of the things about the punk ethos is like, it's always pointing to a war. There's always some sort of dialectic. And that's what, that's what Marxism gets correct. There is a dialectic at play there, right? But the dialectic is a spiritual one. And so it, it, it takes that truth and it, and, it, and it manipulates it to work against the people because that's a natural movement in us to have a dialectic, an oppositional dialectic. We, we, we thrive on that. That's, that's the reality. Right? Because it's real, because the because dialectic real. is real. But, the, but the real. distinction is between the world and the church, right? Like that's the truth. The, 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 the world and the church, which the world includes the flesh, the devil, the world, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Marxism just, it's antichrist because it says, no, 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 the dialectic is between class. No, 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 the dialectic is between race. No, 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 you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. the, the dialectic is between gender. The dialectic is, is a materialist dialectic, right? And there's truth to that. That there is a dialectic and there's truth that part of the dialectic is material but it's only part of the truth and that part of the truth is made the whole and that's why it's idolatry okay. that's yeah. why it's idolatry right whereas the church says yeah yeah dialectic check uh a material dialectic uh half a check you know what i mean but you're missing the spiritual dial they're missing the spiritual component to it and really it's a it is in opposition to, to christ to god this yeah. is so this is so interesting father like i want to i want to drill down a little on this because it's like the i think to, with what andrew said about like the alphabet the alphabet su support of the alphabet soup and then it goes too far or like you said about like jumping off the car mm -hmm. is that it's like if it's the if it's the church then like obviously it's like no you will not be turned away because you have had these you've done these practices in the past like you can be you can be redeemed mm -hmm. within the church you've done this in the past so mm -hmm. yes the church the church is like ready for you to come so there's the acceptance there of you right to come even though you've done these things but that doesn't mean that the things that you've done are okay and right. so then we should and that's where the that's where the the slip happens and they're off the royal path right because what what's lost is the church, the Holy Spirit will always grind you down to what is the essence? What's the intention? See, people get tripped up on the externals. They get tripped on the on off on the peripherals, right? But if you follow what the Holy Spirit leads someone to, right, he'll always get you off of that if you're willing to listen and get you to the core thing, right? Get you to the core thing. So, like for instance, let's just take some let's take a random thing, right? Let's take a um, let's take a white supremacist, right? He has an experience. He let's say he just finds himself into orthodoxy because it's like he thinks it's a, an ethnically pure or whatever, right? But lo and behold, you know, like Porfirio's the actor. It's like even though he got baptized for, you know, the wrong reasons, something actually happens, mm -hmm. and he has an experience, and he starts seeing like, oh, this is wrong. You know what I mean? Because all human beings have the potential to be deified. Therefore, if they have the potential for me to look at someone based upon their ethnicity and say they can't be deified because of that, that's that's wrong, right? So he begins to work through these things. He's like, okay, great, right? Now here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is now kind of like taking an aspect of something and he's slowly peeling it away. There's a kernel there. There's a kernel in desiring to want, you know, a people, the desire to want dignity, the, the desire to want to rebel against like, you know, the all the disillusion and the, the fragmentation that's coming from globalism. That That's a thing. Right. But he came into it, this, it being the thing. Right. But an encounter with the, the Holy Trinity begins to boil all that stuff away. And what's left is a kernel that kernel of truth that now lets him to see like, oh, I was looking for a people. I was looking for an ethnos, but like I found it in the Christian race. You know what I mean? I was looking for something to really combat this globalism that was, you know, melding down distinctions. Oh, I found the church, which honors the complementary nature of like peoples and genders. You see what I'm saying? but it doesn't go to this other extreme. We can do it with anything else. We can take it with sexual preference. We can take it with whatever your thing is, right? 
because the devil has lured you into the idolatry of that thing, the identity portion of it. And the Holy Spirit doesn't completely take it out. He's looking for the truth to hold you together, to kind of bring you in deeper and to build, start building out the full picture. Because what ends up happening is, this is why it's so important to submit ourselves to the dogmas and the traditions of the church. Because the dogmas and the tradition of the church, the washing of the word will give us the mind of Christ. And so we'll be able to see sexuality, ethnicity, um, economics, um, aesthetics. We'll be able to see all those things in the light in which they were intended to be, which, by the way, isn't as static as people think it is. There's so much dynamic um, potential in Christ, right? It's it's, But you need to have those boundaries first before you can really see that potential. Does that? Does, I know that was really lofty when I threw out there, but that's no, you need. Well, because because the church, the, the tradition has been revealed. It's not. It, I mean, there's, it's expanded. We see the saints and like it's constantly. It's coherent. It's coherent. It's, it's coherent, coherent, but it's but there's more. There's, like the the liturgy. The, the I mean, there wasn't a New Testament in the first centuries of, of the church, and then there wasn't a, a the liturgy the way that it is, and there was you know what I mean. But it's but it's all coherent. It's, it's none of coherent. it is in conflict. It's all coherent. And it's all coherent because it puts everything in order, mm -hmm. whereas the demonic is all about disorder. Yes, and that disorder facilitates idolatry. Because see, in the chaos of loss of culture, loss of, you know, um, the loss of like all the kind of founding hallmarks of like, of like reality in society, right? That chaos is what makes people susceptible to the impressions and to the conditioning of the antichrist because they're inherently looking for something to, to grab onto, to be sane with, right? They, they need the authority. They need the bread. They need, those things to really help them to to feel safe right and that's that's why the thing about coming to christ is so interesting because christ offers you all those things but without this kind of in the wrong way in the wrong way but without the slavish fear because he's like trust me that's why christ that's one of the many reasons why christ calls us to faith he's like yes i understand everything is disintegrating in front of you but trust me because behold, I make all things new, right? Whereas the devil's like, yep, it's all coming apart. You better grab onto it. You better hold it together. You better, you know what I mean? So grab onto your race, grab onto your sexuality, grab onto, you know, your self-sufficiency, grab into whatever the thing is and you, you keep it together. And as you try to keep it together, you fall apart because you can't, right? And that's why so many of us, have to we end up spending years sometimes spinning our wheels and burning out in the church because we're not learning this lesson right and that's why trying to turn orthodoxy into you know um some sort of like cure-all panacea for something that it wasn't meant to do is problematic because the church that's why chiliasm is 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 bad the church isn't here to preserve an earthly culture. That's not, that's not why it exists. Mm -hmm. Right. So when people don't get that truly, when they don't get it, that's where all these weird distortions come into play. And you can feel it. You can feel when you're talking with someone and like, yeah, I'm Orthodox, but it's like, Ooh, you, you, you just give me these weird, like political vibes you know what I well, mean? because because you, what what you feel or at least what i feel or the thing that marks it for me is like this individual we'll be talking about like this is happening this is happening this is happening and then what they go to is how do how do we stop it mm -hmm. like what can we do to stop it and it's like eh, mm -hmm. it's not oh. gonna stop like <laughs> there, there's no stop it oh, what we're talking about here is so that we don't so that we recognize it so we don't succumb to it Baby. We're not talking. We're not talking about how do we stop it from happening. Baby. We're talking about uh, here it is. Are you seeing it? I'm seeing it. Okay, we're both seeing it. Okay, we're not gonna do it. We're not. Yeah. We're gonna say no. Yeah. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. We're not gonna succumb to it. But there's so much of the like, 
oh, we got to stop this. Like, we got to do X, Y, Z, and we got to stop this. And it's like, you can't stop. You think you can stop this? <laughs> I knew we were going to find the royal path thread through all of this. I knew it at the very beginning. I knew we were going to find it, and there it is. Because the critique is good, but it's like, it's so often like the fruit afterwards, that's where like you end up, like that's how you end up with like, I don't know if you guys have seen that documentary on the dude from, I'm sure you haven't, Cyprian, and I don't even think I've seen the whole thing of the dude from Crass, who like makes mm -hmm. like his own colony. He's got like his own like colony and like, like, um, what's mm -hmm. the word everybody likes? Collective, but it's all hedonism. It's all hedonism. Like he's rejected society. He's seen the materialism. He's seen the things he wants to return back to a more primitive lifestyle. But the problem is, is with the, in that deconstruction, there is no positive Christ-like, like re, like construction. So yeah. he ends up in this like total left field. What's you know? What's just crazy about around. all that? And I know this is super hard for people to hear it because it's hard for some Orthodox to hear it. I mean, some days I feel like it's hard for a majority of Orthodox to hear this, you know, and it's it's a weird thing, man, but I'm going to say it like there is there is no correct or right way to do anything outside of Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we as Orthodox Christians, so many times like we'll go like, OK, on paper. Yeah. But the fact that we think, well, you know what I mean? And I'm just like, no. I know it sounds crazy fundamentalist. Okay, guilty. Guilty as charged, right? Guilty too. Like, I mean, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Like, it literally, nothing works. Nothing truly works the way people are wanting to work or think it can work without Christ. Otherwise, he is the logos. Happen. He is the source of the pattern of anything good. So anything that you try to do outside of that, the shelf life is... You know, it's it's minimal, man. It's really minimal. And I think that's one of the things that, so why do we do anything then? And it, it's like, that's why also we're not nihilists because everything that we do here has eternal ramifications one way or the other. Because this isn't the end of the story. Like that's, that's the whole point. And people live, that's the thing with hedonism. You know, let us eat and drink, you be merry for tomorrow we die. And it's like, no, that's that's the point, man. It's not because eating and drinking is bad. It's because we're not going to die. Like, we're, you're going to live forever, one way or the other. I think that this is this that presenting it that way. And this is a very much the orthodox phronema about the idea of eternal life that is missing out of Protestantism is that it's like, no, no, no. It's just a fact. Like it's a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. I think that in Protestantism, it's like, oh, we're going to get eternal life because we're Christians. And it's like, no, 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 no. You've got eternal life. That's just what, no, that's you right. have eternal life. That's like right. it's, it's just a question of what that eternal eternity is going to be like. That's right. That's right. That's right. And so it's not like there's the category like door one and door two, which it's like, yeah, it's door one and door two, but they're both going in, they're going in different directions, but they're, they're both eternal life. And people really, um, they miss out on the life here in a lot of ways. Because here's the other thing, like those of us who've done it know, hedonism sucks. It like does. It does. You get to a point. Even in the very short term. Yeah, it's just, you have to convince yourself that it's that yeah, it's good. It's, you have to lie to yourself. Fun, this is OK. <laughs> or you really have to really just nothing matters. I mean, like, listen, and we all know it as, you know, as practicing Orthodox Christians, because, man, maybe five days into post fast, I'm like, man, I'm ready for a fast again. I'm oh, over this. Real. I'm, I'm, I'm I was like, thinking that yesterday. I was thinking that yesterday. <laughs> it's like, my stomach hurts all the time. It's now. like, okay, come on. Let's, let's, let's bring the fast back. You know what I mean? Like, that's reality. Yeah. There's only so many burgers you can have before it just doesn't feel good anymore. Yeah. You, know, like, you said it yesterday, Father. There's a little celebration for Father and you had a big plate of food in front of you. And, um, you said it. I had never heard it phrased that way before, but I don't want to turn my joy into pain. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Like, and that's a very, very good way of putting it because it that's what it is. You go for that last two slices of pizza when you're on like already on like number four. Mm-hmm. You're like, okay, I know what I'm doing here. Like, mm-hmm. I know that this is the tipping point. This is the point at which like things start. Oh, to we, we say it. We say it when we're about to do it. We oh, know yeah. it so much that we articulate it to everybody around. Oh man, I'm going for this. I'm go. I know this is the bad. I know I've gone <laughs> no. beyond my limits. I know where this is going. And I, I just, I just want to say this part right here too. And that's why it's so important to have a sense of humor and to not take yourself too seriously sometimes, because that's the only way out. Sometimes that's the only way out. I'll, I'll tell you something. You know, I'm. Everyone knows I'm Mister. Like, well, it's all about repentance. Yada yada. It is. But that doesn't always, it's not always the dour road. It's not always, you know what I mean? Like repentance can be so sweet with with a sense of humor because the humility of being like, yeah, I went too far. You know what I mean? Be and, humble and, and know you love pizza. And, yeah, I, and that, the humility of accepting that, that's part of what can save us. You and it's I mean? such a relief too. It's, it's such a relief. Save us. It just ends the conflict inside you when you say, yeah, I messed up there. I did that. Yep. I totally own that. And then suddenly, oh, man, I've been meaning to talk to you about this. Oh, I was reading the Psalms the other day, and it was like, please help my foot not to slip for that for that magnifies the voices against me mm-hmm. or something like that. And it was talking about like when you sin, the accusing voices like get louder. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, that mm-hmm. is so poignant. And like, and you know what? You know what quiets them down? Is admitting what you did and having a sense of humor, being able to laugh at yourself. That's like my whole thing. Well, that's, that's the like best humor, thing. self self effacing humor. I mean, if you're a comedian and you're not self effacing, you're basically you're not funny. You're a jerk. You're kind of a jerk. Nobody's. It's not funny. There's no funny. All all humor is self effacing. It has to be. Which which I don't think is Daniel interesting. Is terribly self effacing. Like I would say, like when you point mm. the criticism outward all the time. Like you, there are comedians who. But do. look at his shelf life. Look at Daniel Tosh. Look at his shelf oh, life. I'm not arguing that Dane short, Cook. Short shelf. Dane Cook. Short shelf life. One hundred percent. No. Short 100%. shelf life. Percent. And I'm. I mean, that's one of the things. I mean, I'm not so into her anymore. That was one of the main things I loved about Tina Fey, is her self-effacing, like always criticizing, always kind of putting herself down. That's why I love Morrissey. A lot of his lyrics are self-like effacing. Is talking constantly about like. The silly inact like the silly things he does, the horrible like little social interactions he has, the way he goofs things up all the time. I think that's like my whole thing. Is it's just like I literally have whatever dude tattooed on my hand. It's like whatever dude, like yeah, you did that thing, you did it, and you just got to own it. Like because when you own it, like nobody can really use it against you. It's like oh yeah, no, that's true. I did do that. Well, all you really wanted to do was help that person for money. Yeah, that's true. I was really thinking about that 20 bucks at the end. I really, really liked the idea of getting money for doing this. There was This was not a selfless act. I was definitely trying to get something at the end of this. So it just shuts everybody up. Except but it's, also, be- it's, it's also the fractal of, the, of this box of the, the boundaries, right? That it's like developing this. To, so to know, to basically be like, I've, got, I've gone outside the boundary. I know I've gone outside the boundary. I'm recognizing that I've gone outside of the boundary. I'm articulating that I've gone outside the boundary. Right. Because, yeah. it, the, the, and there's, there's a, that's a, that's the awareness. That's the awareness that like, there's a, the, the spiritual component of that, because I know so many people, it really is. It really is the well, mark listen, of awareness. Right. I mean, this is a big part of our discipline, which is staying inward. Right. You want to critique, your brother, your sister, your wife, your husband. No, no, no. Stay inward, right? The boundary is you. You know what I mean? If if we lived a way, if we lived in the way that we recognize we are the boundary, keeping it internal, right? Like, sure, there's a moment where you can go external, but like the problem is we're always focused outward, external, right? And so it's like we were talking, I think we were talking about this when I was bringing up like one of the, a core thread with mental illness is the externalization of yes. things, you know I mean? and addiction, the externalization of things, the inability to maintain the inward focus and like ding, ding, chicken wing. That's what prayer is all about. That's why, like I was talking with someone 
who's struggling with their faith and uh and it's just hard because like i pray that god enlightens him but it's like he doesn't understand what prayer is and like you know god help him like a lot of us don't but prayer fundamentally is about maintaining that inward because that's where god is like you you're gonna find god inside not external right and so i just see people all the time they're spinning their wheels it's like man and it and people don't want to hear this they don't want to hear it. look get your eye off the other person you know not just because it's not polite not just because it's immoral not just because it's not a proper christian ethic but because that's number one why you keep getting jacked up and wrecked Number two, that's the only way out is this boundary of looking at yourself. That's the way out. That's the way to understand. That's the way to create. That's the way to be renewed. That's the way to find God. But when we all, when we constantly want to escape that tough spot, yeah, you know, ego is a, ego is a son of a gun, man. Son of a gun, you know? Well, and it's it, that, that external looking like, the demons, I'm, I'm, this is going to me to uh, the screw tape letters right now, but it's like the demons want you to oh, yeah. make that external focus. Oh, yeah. They're like, they're like please the look externally. Please, do, please yeah. don't spend any an yep. introspection, yep. right? Be praying, but be thinking about how terrible. Well, I mean, it's the publican and the Pharisee. You know what I mean? Like, be like looking at praying, but you're looking at the other person. Mm hmm. Such a trap. That's, Such a trap. That I think that ultimately that's one of the strongest things that I can use when I'm working with people is like, because people say that a lot where they're like, what, how did my use hurt anybody? How did my buying crystal meth and injecting it into my arm hurt anybody? I'm like, well, let me break down. It hurt next... you. <laughs> well, sure. Sure. But that, that you can't tell that to a junkie because when you, when you're talking to an alcoholic, I was there, I was there. And when you talk about either you stop using or you die, you have to really think about it. Cause I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. This dying thing doesn't sound so bad. Like, you know, um, or we think that the dying thing doesn't sound so bad, but we cry like babies when we're actually presented. But the point is, is like, well, how did my use hurt anybody except for myself? I'm like, well, let's break down what a Mexican drug cartel is. Mm -hmm. Let's break down what they do. Let's break down, like, how do you support? Because well, that's I the argument with porn, right? I mean, that's one of the arguments with porn. I was just about to say that. Exactly. Exactly. But for this case, it's like, let's talk about the sex trafficking they do. Let's talk about the child, the children who are murdered without disregard. Let's talk about the employ of sociopaths and demonic activity activity that takes place, the cult practices that take place. And I can tell you right now, I'm not supporting a Mexican drug cartel because mm -hmm. I'm not buying their drugs anymore. Now, if you're still continuing to buy their drugs, you are officially hurting other people in some small way. You are somewhat culpable for what that person is doing. If you cannot turn this around and find a way to add your part, and this is one of the reasons why I love Peter Parker as Spider-Man. Peter Parker is always, it's my fault. I did this. I should have tried harder. This is on me. I should have tried a little bit harder, even to the point of being like where everyone around is telling him, stop beating yourself up. You don't have to take this on. He's like, I do. I did this. And the thing is, it's like genuinely, I'll be quiet. It is sometimes his fault. He, you know, I mean, he killed Gwen Stacy. Green Goblin did not. When Green Goblin knocked Gwen Stacy out the bridge or threw out the bridge, it was Peter's arrogance and grabbing her ankle with the spider with his web shooter that snapped her neck and killed her. So like he and like Uncle Ben, like his origin story where he was arrogant, he fell into pride and chose not to help that robber or to help the security guard. The robber ran past him and killed Uncle Ben. That's on him. Like that, like uh, I won't go, I won't continue, but like I was reading a story where like two different Spider Men were talking. It was Miles Morales and Peter Parker were talking. And they're from two different dimensions, but they're in the same dimension and they're talking, whatever. And Miles Morales basically says, like, no, Spider Man, the costume, who Spider Man is, is your pain. That is who Spider Man is. 
Spider-Man is all your failures is all your ex it's like an externalization of all your failures, all the ways you've fallen, all the hurt that you've received, all the grief that you have, every inadequacy that you have is Spider-Man. That's why Spider-Man is constantly joking. That's why his fear is constantly covered up by laughing. And like he, he, he never blames externally. He's always like, this is on me that like Spider-Man is just an outward reflection of who Peter Parker is as a human being is this need to repent, you know, like to the degree that a comic book character can, but like he, he repents in the sense of like, no, no one dies around me ever again. Like, because of me, like no one dies around me ever again. So many people have died around him and he's just like, this is not going to happen again. And the only way I can do this is by continuing to bear my cross to the Vic because Spider-Man lays waste to his personal life. He is constantly getting into trouble because of Spider-Man. So when he is able to continue to do that, to continue to suffer losses, to continue to miss out on life and miss relationships and make things complicated with people around him, even target people that he loves when he comes out with his public identity. Every time he like tries to shed that cross one way or the other by falling all the way into Spider-Man or all the way into Peter Parker, then like he loses that tension, that tension. The only thing that's like keeping him going. And but the question is, does Spider-Man, does that, does Spider-Man, the suit and all of that, is that not Peter Parker's idol then? Like, is that not actually, does Peter Parker not actually have Spider-Man as an idol? And, and I think that that's in some ways, that's what's being explored with, with the idea of Venom, right? Is that it's like, this this is actually an external entity, Spider Man, and the reason why well, I say this, as I hear you saying this, is because I inhabited a character that wasn't me, that people thought was a hero, right, and that had a lot of things associated with that, and it was like, and I put on, I had a superhero costume that I put on, right, and I became another, and I had superpowers, as far as people could tell, mm -hmm. and like as I stepped, as I've been able to. That was a big thing that I had to shed. And I realized that like, it was actually another, it was, it, call it what, I don't know what to call it, right? But it was something, uh, it was something. It was something more than that suit. Like it was an entity in and of itself that had its well, own, I would step into it and it would have its own things this, at that point. So I hate well, to isn't split. That, that's an interesting thing because the contrast with Venom and Spider-Man is that thing. Yes. Well, and Venom is possession. Eddie, yes, well, yes. And Venom is a means to an end for Eddie because Eddie wants revenge. Eddie Brock wants revenge on Peter Parker. And the reason I'll just say this really quick. And but isn't Spider-Man a means to an end for him to uh, for assuage atonement. his guilt? For atonement. It's not a sweet. Well, is it, a, because... is it atonement or is it guilt? Um, I think atonement because in Ultimate Spider-Man, Spoiler for a comic that came out 10 years ago or 15 years ago, Peter Parker dies. And, and that's a different light timeline, but he's dead. He is killed by the Sinister Six. Um, ironically enough, while saving Captain America, he pushes Captain America out of the way, gets shot in the back by the Punisher, I think, by the Punisher, and then has to go off and save because the Sinister Six are on their way to go kill May uh, Aunt May. Um so when he gets there and he dies, his last words are, I couldn't save Uncle Ben, but I managed to save you guys. I managed to do it. I finally got to do it. And then he dies. And those are his last words. So interesting. The, the reason why I would say that they're different is because one of the things that makes Peter Parker so great is because there is no integration between a superhero and their alternate identity as well as Spider-Man. Spider-Man is Peter Parker and Peter Parker is Spider-Man. So much of the so that Nick Spencer in one of his runs actually used this like comic book magic to separate them. Spider-Man and Peter Parker become two different things. So Spider-Man becomes all power, no responsibility. Peter Parker becomes all responsibility, no power. Mm -hmm. This takes me back to, to Batman Ego by Darwin Cook, in which Batman basically... Father, have you read this? Mm-mm. Okay, so basically Batman has a bad encounter with someone who basically stands on top of a bridge and Batman thinks he's a bad guy, but he's not. He's like, no, you and Joker killed my family. Joker threw a bomb, something like that. I can't remember exactly. And it killed my family. I have nothing to lose. And he shoots himself in the head. 
So Batman goes naturally sends him into his existential crisis, and he basically goes and he has an argument with Batman, Bruce Wayne in the Batcave, and the cowl basically manifests as this person. Man, this is a great comic, Father, and it's all Darwin Cook. I mean, I really yeah, got to lend this to you. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, and he basically argues like in the Batman's like Batman is telling Bruce Wayne, you, uh, you called to me for help. Like you called to me, like you want, you swore and I am, you swore an oath to your mom and your dad to wage a war against crime. I'm the way that you do that. You cannot do this without me. That is not Peter Parker. Peter Parker in Spider-Man, there's this like this, and I hate to use this because it brings up the venom analogy, but there's a symbiotic relationship between the two. They need, e they need each other and Batman needs Bruce Wayne, but it's a totally different relationship. It's a completely different relationship. So it's almost a parent. It is a parasitic relationship. The Batman, Batman and Bruce Wayne. One hundred percent. They're, they're parasites seen, on one another. If you've seen, well, Batman is a Co parasite codependent. Bruce Wayne. Well, oh, but but Alfred. Are, are you it. sure? No, are you Alfred's... sure? Are you sure Bruce Wayne isn't also a parasite on Batman? Batman has nothing to lose. Batman's got no horse in this race. Like Batman's got nothing to lose. Bruce Wayne is using Batman in to like further his war against crime. If we were to take this, like Alfred sees this too. Alfred sees it and says, I wish you would stop being Batman. If you had seen the 2022 Batman, the Batman with mm. Robert Pattinson, mm. this is a heavy theme throughout that movie. Mm. It's a heavy theme throughout all Batman, but it's a heavy theme of like, you are killing yourself by doing this. You are killing yourself by becoming Batman. Bruce Wayne's like, I do not care. I do not care what happens to but me. But if Bruce Wayne ceased to be Batman, would there be any meaning in his life? Uh, well, like, I hate to bring this up, but yes, there are times where Batman has been, uh, where Bruce Wayne, uh, particularly during Scott Snyder's run, falls into a thing of Dionysium, other the Raza Ghoul Lazarus pit, and it heals his brain, including the trauma of losing his parents. So he has no drive. It heals his brain to the point where he has no drive, and he does find fulfillment. He does find happiness. But as Bruce Wayne as he is now with the quote-unquote trauma or whatever from losing his parents then he continues to perform the right or whatever that allows the batman quote-unquote demon to inhibit or to take material yeah, this, this is just this is interesting because way back when in another in another lifetime i'd begun writing a batman story oh and okay the whole premise was basically batman encounters a supernatural force which he can't reconcile with and then through that supernatural force it causes him to kind of explore his catholic background with his family like on his mom's side and then there's this whole like, bringing this whole thing with like crusader and all the stuff and all the stuff but the reason why i bring it up i think this is really interesting is Batman is fundamentally the type of character that has to exist in a world where there is no God in the sense that mm -hmm. there's no way for him to really exist if there is a means of healing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I've always, that, that's the one thing that I, I never understood. I've always loved Batman and I've never understood that aspect up until like, later on obviously. oh or else he can't be a good guy he can't that's, a, that's if exactly if the thing. if god exists in batman's world then batman can't be then there's no way batman could be considered a good guy exactly and so for me Ooh, that's the interesting solution for the story i was writing was he actually ends up discovering faith discovering repentance and then not only just advocating the cow but systematically disbanding all the other like bat family and really like and like his repentance then is dismantling the Batman like legacy because he recognizes that it ends up essentially being an idol. And essentially he's created this whole family and system that has taken the place and, and has actually gotten in the way of true justice. Yes. Very much like when someone has trauma, that response, trauma, <laughs> but that that initial response that the the body 
and the mind produced to survive outlives itself. Yes. And that living itself, that's what the quote unquote PTSD is, right? So it's really like a take on Batman and the whole bat existence and family as like um, a, a symbol for for PTSD. If I that mean, makes sense, you know, and I think that that that's that is one aspect of like Batman exists long after his need to exist. Mm -hmm. Like he creates his own reason for existence. Mm -hmm. And I'm, uh, I'll say it right here. Like the lore behind Andrew is Batman was my very first word as a child in this world. I said, so immediately God knew what he was working with. So he was like, okay, I got to steer mm -hmm. Andrew into these side of comics that can be redeemed. But Batman ultimately, I don't really buy the argument that like, villains only exist because of batman mm -hmm. but batman batman would not exist without his villains mm -hmm. so the, right there you're seeing something problematic like mm -hmm. right there like the goal of captain america is kill red skull for good so that we can be done like like end injustice american injustice so we can be done like steve rogers that's why in the movies he eventually stops he's like i'm done doing this i don't want to do this anymore but like that's not going to be batman and we that's evidenced from kingdom come as evidence from dark knight returns he doesn't want to stop he never wants to stop which he, by, can't. he can't he can't stop. he can't yeah. and, and batman's also in some regard a critique of ideology and this is what happens with people when this is a whole other thing i was talking about at that in my my talk on on beauty was that people end up you know i was talking about how people like you know the slave the servant and the son but i changed servant to soldier because it's like slave is motivated out of out of fear you know but then i changed it to soldier instead of servant because the soldier finds the right finds the reward in in the fight in the combat and there's there's value to it defending what you believe in right but the problem is, is not only is it just reward based, but it very easily can become ideological. And you see this where ideology becomes the stopping point and, and people don't move past sun because what happens when you're perpetually at war? You, you, you lose the whole purpose of what you're even fighting for. And thus, in many ways, you become the means of destroying the thing that you first loved. You know what I mean? So it's it's a very it's the it's the military industrial complex. It's the it demon really that underlies the military industrial complex, right? Is the idea that well, you got to go find the war now. Yes, right. Exactly. Like you have to you have to find one. It's like well, but we're but it's peace now, and it's like no 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 no. It can't be. There's never peace. That's right. But that's... and Batman Batman is a, in some ways he is a, also a critique of the military industrial complex because look at all his gadgets. Yep, that's right. The guys, and that's what I mean. You get a you get a real explicit glimpse of that in the uh, Ryan Nolan, uh, uh, Christopher Nolan. Excuse me, Ryan Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Nolan. It's Christopher late. Nolan with you know with the whole Tumblr and just like a sure. whole that whole insight into that, you're facilitating that. That's interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. because you know he had to. You think about how long it would take to design and manufacture those things mm -hmm. before you use them. Mm -hmm. So you're looking with this outlook of like decades, right? <laughs> that you're like, well, and you're not going to need it in every situation. So how long will it be before you need this particular item? But yeah. that's, right? that's, that's that whole, like, and people criticize it. The, the God strength Batman is, is like, he's the i i would say in the dc universe the smartest man alive so mm -hmm. he's seeing everything all perspective all which is like i think father and i were just texting about this the other day about like how he has a um you know like people get like there's this huge story run called the tower of babylon which raz al ghul an enemy of batman steals his plans for taking down each member of the justice league so like and so he weaponizes all those things against him but like then we have alternate storylines where superman goes crazy you know and no one's there to take him out and people get mad at batman because he always has these things ready to go 
like like there's this but but isn't that but uh, i mean think about that machiavellianism for just a minute right i mean think but... about the machiavellianism of like wait a minute so what you're telling me is you allied with me but in your alliance with me the whole time you had a whole situation for no. uh, just in case i, need I to will take this dude out just and in this case is... We are running low on time, but I will die on this hill <laughs> because there have been so many alternate storylines where someone goes bad and no one can do anything about it. What do you do when Superman goes bad? Like, there's nothing you can do. But, you know, but you know, there no. are always there always is this question, right? Because I think about this like this is actually interesting to think about, right? It's like war in Ukraine, right? We could t we could take this to the war in Ukraine, right? And they're like. You know, if only there was a weapon that did X, Y, Z, that would be perfect for like the Ukrainians are like, that would be the perfect defense. And then they're like, oh, there happens to be this weapon or we don't even have to do that. Like the MRNA poke. Mm. Like how long? It's like, wait a minute. How long has that been there? <laughs> you produced, yeah, for real. Wait, you produced how many billion doses in how long it's. I've heard I've heard people talk about this where they're like there would have been no way to yeah. tool up factories. Yeah. Never mind the design of it. Never mind to the, get a prototype. No, no, no. You couldn't have tooled up the factories yeah. to make that many doses in that amount of time. It would yes. have been literally impossible. So that means you were manufacturing. You had to be manufacturing doses beforehand. And this is what I'm talking about, about this idea of Batman and having all the things that then you go, oh, but look at all the examples of people going crazy. And then it's like, oh, but look at, if they wouldn't have made it, then we, and then you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, maybe, maybe there's more to the story about them going crazy. Maybe they went crazy so that this thing could be used against them. Like maybe there's, maybe there's a deeper level. You understand? Think... Maybe you're not predicting it. Maybe you're causing it. Maybe. Well, no, that's always hinted at. That's, that's always, always hinted, hinted at, at with you are the creator of me. I'm a villain. You're the creator of me. That's mm -hmm. always hinted at. And I think like what Cyprian just like, you just dropped it down a level. So instead of it looking like a one-to-one -one creating the origin story of said villain, it's even deeper than that. Elder Thaddeus, our thoughts determine our lives, right? And and this is this is part of the thing is because the Christian mind is a mind that isn't getting back to the whole dialectic. A Christian mind is pulled out of that, seeing the world as conflict and dialectic exclusively, exclusively. The Christian mind is, yes, aware of the wiles of the devil. Yes, aware of the need to fight the passions, but it's always a means. It's not the end. The end is love. The end is to be with Christ. The end is to be with the saints. The end is to be with our loved ones. The end is to enjoy paradise. The end is to is to experience God, which is eternal wisdom, knowledge, joy, peace, all those things, right? Everyone, everything else, though, is locked in this. I don't, I don't want to say Marx's worldview because it's, that's an explicit term, but you get what I'm saying. Everything's dialectic, right? You against me. I need to get this. You're you're in the way of me getting this, right? Limited resources. Limited conflict resources. over limited resources. Limited yeah. resources. The war of walls. I mean, I see this with I see this with Christians, right? Where it's like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I may even be, you know, whatever. But you're still locked into this. Everything's about I got to make money. I got to make money. I got to make money, which is a dialectic, right? I gotta, you know. You're cutting out my benefits. You're doing this. You're doing that. Got to make money. Got to make money. Got to make money, right? It's still that dialectic, right? Because there's no rest in it. Everything is a, everything is about our perpetual combat. And it's the end, not a means, right? And that mindset produces the means and the opportunities for said conflicts, right? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that's the whole thing that when... Self-fulfilling self prophecy. Self-fulfilling self prophecy. prophecy. Yeah, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. If you I mean... spend, if you spend the effort to create something, you know, just in case something happens, 
you've increased the chances of that thing happening. Yeah. Like that's just a spiritual, that's just a spiritual truth, right? If I, if I exert effort, the, the prime, the prime example to take it to just to something like really personal that I'm like, this is something that I can really speak on having like really examined relationships in this way, especially romantic relationships, your, your insecurity about your significant other cheating on you is exactly what will make them cheat on you. Absolutely. Yep. But however, however, and father can back me on this in the comic injustice, Batman in no way like created the situation that eventually led to Superman becoming bad. And he really had no countermeasures against Superman. Like he, like that was one of the cruxes of injustice it's like you look at like Dark Knight Returns. Batman, Superman is sitting there helpless. Batman says, "I just want you to remember, I'm the one man who beat you." You know, like I, I mean, he doesn't say this, but it's implied. I could kill you right now. I could kill you. And um, even Batman versus Superman, he's standing there with the rod, getting ready to bring it down and kill Superman. And like none of that stuff was well. That doesn't work so well on Batman versus Superman. Blah blah blah. Whatever. The point is, is that at a certain point, like. Batman can't be like, oh man, I lost my point. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm I'm going to say that like those backup measures because this is something I've defended for a while now, arguing with other. Well, I'll tell you what the problem is. Forgive me. You know what the problem is right now? You're actually trying to take Batman. Like you're losing it because instead of seeing Batman as the measure of the symbol of the philosophy or the ideology or the movement, you're coming back to what, what's been done or certain scenarios. But I think the reality of it is, is, and this is what's fascinating about Batman is that as a golem or as a, um, um, as a golem, essentially, he represents this archetype that we are forced to look at. Okay. Yeah. And 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 that's the key thing to understand. So it's not about like going into like a one a what if realm. Like who cares about like the thing is though is like how does this how does what is he revealing for us in light of this? And and I think it I think even that right there is an interesting thing because in the same way, this is where it's like super meta, in the same way Batman loses sight of what he's supposed to be doing because of himself, we can also lose sight of what these archetypes are there to serve because of the archetype itself. You know what I mean? Mm. It's 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 a super credible thing because in my mind, it gets us back to what we were originally talking about in regards of punk as critique. And people lose punk as critique because they begin to look at punk. And it's like, yeah. no, 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 it, you don't look at the atom. You know what I mean? Because if you do that, it, it's you won't be able to observe it. It'll stop. But it's like when you don't look at it, right? Then you're able to. Then the movement happens, right? It's yeah. like you look at the light, you look at the star from the corner of your eye. It's brighter if you look at it directly. It's yeah. it's the principle of seeing without looking. Yes, you. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's seeing you, without looking, and look, yeah, it's symbol. It's symbol versus sign, as Joseph Campbell would say, right? Symbol like if we look at like. If we look at Batman the sign, right, then we're going in and we're looking at Batman as this actual character and here's the things that happen with him, right? But what actually makes Batman a hero is he provides a, at a like a hero outside of what he's doing in the book, right? Like what makes him a hero in the real world? Mm-hmm. Like what makes him a hero like an actual hero to me that's mm-hmm. salvific and who can save me? Mm-hmm. is that his symbol allows me to see something that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to see. That's something that, about reality. That's right? what the whole first 10 minutes of that Batman movie are about. Yeah. The fir- I don't know if you've seen it, Cyprian, but Mm-mm-mm. the first 10 minutes of that movie, that's all it is. Is people is people's is different villains, different criminals reacting to seeing the symbol in the sky. That's literally like the first 10 minutes of that movie is it's like these three different scenarios where three different people are committing three different crimes. And each one of them happened to look up and see the symbol in the sky and their reaction mm. to that afterwards. And like, well, this... I, I mean to see, th- see, they're scared of Batman, but right. That... Like they're, they're, they're scared of him. I mean, more like being able to see, for instance, as we've done here, like 
being able to see Batman as the military industrial complex, Mm -hmm. right? Like being able to see Batman as the pharmaceutical industry, right? Like that's what really makes him a hero is because one of the things that you could see in those and what humanizes, because it humanizes a pharmaceutical executive. It humanizes a, a, um, a CEO of Raytheon, right? Because they're like, no, 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 no. But there are going to be threats. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're creating this thing, because there's going to be threats. And when there's threats, you're going to want us Mm -hmm. to be there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, but by you creating those threats, you by you preparing for those threats, you also have an incentive to create the threats. Mm -hmm. Like there's a part of you that's creating those threats. And I think that like without Batman, like Batman becomes a means for people to easily understand that very complex and subtle dance that's playing Mm -hmm. that it's really hard. It's really hard to understand and to humanize without Batman Mm -hmm. or something like Batman. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is why, which I guess is why like, um, which is why in the pantheon of let's say like Greek mythology or some, pagan mythology you have to have the gods who are sort of eat like the loki types the trickster so yeah. why they get to be gods too right like and why why is there virtue maybe you don't worship them but there's virtue in them being recognized i guess i guess as a symbol of like the the darkness yeah and so the thing is is what's interesting is that i did a whole thing on this at the uh doxicon about the, the purpose of the anti-hero. And so the rise of the anti-hero is a necessary thing, getting again back to the punk critique, the rise of the anti-hero really starting in the mid seventies with, you know, I, I put it at with like Michael Moorcock and like Elric and then like the kind of like subsequent rise in the eighties with like Batman becoming firmly entrenched as an anti-hero and the kind of like, the dark aspect of that, like all that was necessary because of the same reason why punk was necessary as a critique of where Western society really, but the world is headed. Yeah. And so you need those critiques, you need those um, literary tools, those symbolic tools um, of the subcult, you know, the critique of punk, the anti hero, to really give place to rise of these aspects of Christ that have been relegated to the end. Yes. So these aspects of Christ have been relegated to the end, which are, you know, there's these three core things to the end, to the anti-hero, um, which are interesting in regards of, um, you know, the anti-hero um, obviously like suffers, you know, um, and suffers alone the anti-hero suffers in opposition to, you know, an external force, you know, all these things we begin to see in the life of Christ in a different way, because up until modernity, Christ is seen still in the light of a almost exclusively, like almost Pollyanna-ish, almost like in a Pollyanna-ish light, Father, what does that word mean? So Pollyanna, well, there's a whole thing too. Pollyanna was a character, which I can't remember what, what time period she comes in, but this, the statement or the, the term Pollyanna is like a very kind of syrupy, saccharine. Okay. Um, everything's okay. Everything's great, yeah. you know? Sugar and spice and everything nice. Sugar and spice and everything nice. So, so the thing is, is like, you know, this is the rise of the, the buddy Christ. This is a rise of the, you know, the kind of Mormon Jesus painting of like the happy, handsome, smiling Jesus, like all these things which dim and and almost cause to be excised, you know, the suffering Christ, the antihero Christ, like the one, the Christ who is calling to account the social order in which he's the judge. Happy. No, fa- the no, judge. Father, forgive me, the judge. Like that's what people don't want. They don't want Christ yeah. the judge. They don't want him. No. Well, no, they do want Christ the judge of 
of their enemies. Yes. They don't want Christ to judge right. themselves. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 Not, so, they want to externalize the judgment. So the anti-hero, yes. the anti-hero actually gives rise for people like us to see like Christ, the judge of me, mm -hmm. not just Christ, the judge of like my enemies, right? Not Christ as that's the whole power of it. Not Christ as the instrument of um, projecting my desires and my vengeances on my enemies, culturally, whatever. That, that's my point is that in the light of modernity and basically the, the, the punk critique it uncovers part of the fruit of it is it uncovers these aspects of Christ, which are powerful in regards of like, that's the key one seeing the judge of me. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that everyone is being judged, but like me first, that's, Maybe. that's a, it's such a terrible, like terrifying. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's Even a terrifying there. vision of Christ. I don't think many people want like they, they're, will allow themselves to have that terrifying vision of Christ. Because here's the thing. This is going to be crazy, but behold, I make all things new, but also he's the destroyer of worlds. He's the destroyer of worlds. Like all of the worlds that have been propped up, set up, constructed, he will, he is their downfall. He is the destroyer of worlds. Because right. his because the enemy is the prince of this world. So That's of right. course he That's when right. he's defeated, the world will be destroyed. Whoa. Casting down imaginations, Whoa. casting down every stronghold, right? That's what like man, every human being is a universe. That's not flowery language. Within every human being is is a myriad of infinite potentiality and and and, and a myriad of experiences that have happened, right? And so within that, all these worlds, he's the destroyer of worlds yeah. because every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess. And so think about the exponential. You're talking about the exponential growth of AI's intelligence and ability to create, right? Overlay that over the, the, the human genius, the human spirit, genius in the old timey term, spirit. And we being imbued with the image of God, but not the likeness. And the likeness would be taking the gifts of the image of God and being able to exponentially multiply paradise, joy, hope, love. That's what the saints do. The saints produce and manifest just the world, the paradise, the facets of the gem. But the inverse is also happening. Yeah. Right? The inverse of all these worlds which are false, which are antichrist. So they exist insofar as they have, they don't truly exist because they don't share in the light of Christ. So in that sense, right, they're shadows. And in that sense, they're anti-life equation. But th that anti-life in the sense of how we're talking now, they, it has an existence. And he, he is the destroyer of worlds. So, and so we, we as children of the apocalypse, we begin, that's why we say Maranatha, come Lord, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because the world, as they grow, they're a cancer. If you begin to see the world, like man, the, the kind of like macro of man, right? What is cancer? The abundance of cells, right? So the so these cells, the, and the imagination of man, which is being, it's like everything that we're talking about, the digital media, the movements, everything that's happening outside of Christ, it's sugar to cancer cells. It's causing everything to grow. Yes. And so these tumors, which are worlds, yes, yes, are, are, yes. are growing exponentially. And there comes the time when <sighs> the body, the cosmic body of man that is seeking to set the, the cosmic body of the Babylonian man, the man of Babylon, the whore of Babylon, all these, however you want to look at it, as it becomes filled with cancer, there comes the point when the destroyer of worlds comes and he says, no, no more. And so, behold, I make all things new. So then, okay. So then I wonder if like the sugar to the cancer cells about the creation of people's own worlds, like first off, that's kind of nice then because now it's like, oh, he's off in his own world. Like that kind of gives new light to that, to that phrase. And then not only that, but like, I wonder if that's where a lot of the breakdown of communication is happening right now, because like people are having to speak through their own worlds. So you have all these veils between you and reality, between you and God, these self-imposed veils. 
And it's really hard to yell through them. It's really hard because then you have to work through your veils and the other person's veils as well. So oh, like, and this, this is what, this is what a, sorry, sorry. Go, go ahead, Andrew. But I got, no, I definitely no, got no, some. That's my thought. That's my thought pretty the, much. This is exactly like, for me, this is what I've said is the biggest danger of AI for years. Like I said, this is the real dystopia. It's not Terminator. What it is, yeah. is that on the other end of it, that people just stop talking to each other because all that's what will happen. I said, the real dystopia is you get inside your thing and it's not that everybody's living inside the matrix and they all talk to each other. That's not what's going to happen. They're all living in their own thing. Their own thing. And yeah. all they're interacting with is the machine. Yeah. That's it. Like, and this is, I think that this is what people haven't quite registered yet. That it's like, but, but that was the thing about, we read the heaven banning thing here. We talked about the heaven banning. Right. That's what heaven banning is. Mm -hmm. That the only people interact, you think you've got a million followers. You think people are talking to you. You think people like you. You think you're interacting, but they're all, it's all just the machine. Mm -hmm. It's no other human beings communicating with and, you. And, and just, really that is, that is the other layer of the matrix that people don't want to talk about. Yep. Yep. Right. That's the other layer of the matrix that people don't really talk about. Cause even with, you know, um, your, you know, your bizarro, you know, Mr. Tate talking about the matrix has wounded me on this stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. Yo, I mean, yeah, okay, but like the matrix that's really on the horizon is this one where people are being siloed off, right, mm -hmm. into their own, which is, I mean, we've talked about this so many times before too, right, but that's... Voluntarily, that, Father. Voluntarily. voluntarily. And that's also the running theme of why some people were stuck so long and, and it's like, why? It's like the whole pandemic thing was so obvious, but it's like, well... Mm -hmm. It wasn't so obvious if you're in a room of me. They're they're in a room with mirrors. Yeah, with mirrors. Mm -hmm. It's just it's like they're cut off and they're seeing themselves, which is so interesting because the narcissism of narcissism, but the growing self importance, egoism, and narcissism that's characterizing each generation, right? Mm -hmm. Be subsequently, because it, this this is being facilitated exponentially by the media. Like that's it's what programming us to go into the pods, father. Damn, and then you, and then you got to be like, Autism yeah, but who, but who could plan with that kind of long-term precision to get us to here? And it's like, well, that's, it's not humans. <laughs> now you're ready for a whole it's different not, conversation. Yeah, it's not yeah, humans. No. <laughs> and I, so we're coming up on two hours. We're actually over two hours and that's okay. Yeah. And the last thing I got to say, father, is this, you've talked about this before, punk finger critique. Like, honestly, like that part in Dark Knight Returns, I just got to say this part in Dark Knight Returns were like Batman is a critique almost to the punks, too, because the mutants right at Dude, the end yeah. city shut down. He shows up with a gun yeah, and on a horse. Yeah. He's like, who's going to help me? Yeah. And they're like, we'll help. And then I'm like, oh, I don't want to be a mutant in that situation. I don't want to be part of that gang. So like destruction for destruction's sake, which is not punk. Okay, that's not necessarily within the punk ethos, but that's certainly been a part of it. Mm -hmm. It's just destroying to destroy is like, well, I don't want to be part of that. Like, no, Batman brought order. He brought order, which is categorically, I think, what makes him different than the Joker. Both of them had one bad day and both of them mm -hmm. did two completely different things with it. Joker looked to establish chaos and destroy order. Batman looked to destroy chaos and establish mm -hmm. order. I think I got that right, but whatever. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I just got to throw that in there because I do, um, we should probably, probably wrap it up, even though I, I think that if what I'm seeing is what I'm seeing, and I think I'm seeing it because of you guys, more or less, because, you know, I'm, you know, being drug along, then like, I think that like, I was always one of those people that was like, I hated it when people said like, it's worse now than it ever was. Mm -hmm. and i was like i've always been a person that's like despised that saying and i would cite things from history be like hey you realize that this thing has happened and this horrible thing has happened this it's, it's like worse. now it is worse than it ever is and it's because of exactly what you guys because by the time people go to the pods they're going to be like clamoring for it they gonna be like this is what we want this is dude they're already health. literally clamoring for it for my mental health i need to do this and it's yep. like I, I saw somebody cite for their mental health as a reason to not have children. 
Mm -hmm. Like for my mental health, I can't have children. I was like, you are more honest than you realize about that statement. What you're saying is you're being much more honest than you even realize about what's happening here. Anyway, that's, that's all I got to say mm -hmm. about that. Father, I received an email and it seems like it's something that should be addressed. Um, the person asked me not to name anything specifically, but paying for sacraments. Yay or nay? Like, nay? No. no. Okay. Feel right. free to feel free to bless your priest. You know what I mean? Feel free to bless them. That's appropriate and good. But blessing them is not payment. I don't it, no priest accepts payment for sacraments. Yeah. I mean, okay. if you want to blast, that's fine. Yeah. I I find that my priest really likes coffee. So that's a really good way of like, hey, thanks for coming and blessing our house, Father. Here's a here's a pound of really good coffee. There you go. Mm -hmm. So So no menu, Father. If you run across a, a, a priest who's got a menu, yeah, with the no price list, now, that's probably no not a now I just yeah. want to clarify something too, because there's in certain areas and there's a, a practice of like, well, you know. It's standard to give a priest a hundred yeah, bucks yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's not the same as paying for sacraments. And I'll tell you why, because most people here, they're in a system where there's a parish priest who's paid by the parish, you know, a uh, salary, this and that. But if you go in the old, if you go in the old times, the old countries, it's mm -hmm. like priest didn't have that. Oftentimes mm -hmm. you that the, the priest was paid by the state or the priest was living off of, you know, doing his priestly duties and so it's like yeah you know it's like you want a baptism was whatever you know 50 kopeck or whatever mm -hmm. that's not the same as like paying for the sacraments in some sort of like they're like holding the unction quid, quid pro quo quid, quid pro, pro quo yeah. it's not quid pro quo yeah right it, it's 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 a lot closer to reading the book of numbers and like, mm -hmm. here's the wave offering. Here's the whatever the mm -hmm. portion of it. That that's that's the spirit. It should be understood. In, mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm gonna stop paying you, Father. So I'm just I'm just kidding. I've never paid Father. You gotta start. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> gonna say it. To I've stop. never. I think. <laughs> I think one time I gave Father five bucks because I lost a bet to him. Because I was, I was like, no, this comic book cover is drawn by Jim Lee, and he's like, no, it's Todd McFarlane, and then I was like, bet you five bucks, and I was wrong, so I gave him five. And you know what he did? The next day, it was the next day, I walked up to him in line, I handed him five bucks. He snatched it out of my hand and stuck it in his pocket. And said, I'm gonna take that five <laughs> Good bucks. Good for him. So, yeah. so I did anyway. it for humility. Yeah. That's, That's cool. cool. It's cool. It's like my whole sure thing. I bought like chocolate or something for the kids. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So that's all, folks. Um. Jack. Again. Jack. JPEG. Jack for the thumbnail. Yep. Ah. JPEG. Yeah. Jack. JPEG. JPEG Jack, Jack. You are killing it. Again. I just want to say thank you. Uh. I still Saint Anthony is my favorite so far, but you are still doing a great job. Um. Uh. Every mu most music that we talk to, I still haven't updated it in a couple of weeks. Goes onto a Spotify playlist. Yeah, a lot to put on tonight. Got a lot tonight. I yeah, know. I, I don't think tonight. all of it's getting on there. Not all of it's getting on there. Like, what you mean? I not all it's getting on there. I. You're gonna have to go listen back through and take notes now. Six, You're gonna six, have to jot them down. Nick, it's really time hard. Time zone, Africa. Like, no, no. I no. will go through, and it, you know what? I will do it. And I just told you. And I'm, I'm gonna do it. And it's painful because I can't listen to this show for very long because when I start talking, I'm just like, I can't do this. Like, I'm I'm not doing this anymore. So I will have to go through and suffer through for probably yes. a good hour because we named bands for like the first hour yeah, of this program. Class, this for an hour for sure. Yeah, yeah the class is already sure, yeah. on there without a doubt. The you class. need to tell you, right? Yeah. yeah. Tari um, Tari. Sorry. So it all goes into a Spotify playlist, Royal Path podcast music, something like that. Feel free to reach out at andrew at royalpath.network. Um, those are where you can send your questions. We also have a merch store. We don't see any of the money. It either goes to our 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 parish or and then one third of it goes to the guy who creates the merchandise. That's at royalpath.store. Uh, mm -hmm. Aside from that, um, I can't remember. I feel like there's something else I normally do, but mm -hmm. that's it. That's okay, it. thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.